Good morning. It is nine. Let's begin. Uh, this class is going to be very intensive. We're trying to cover two topics instead of one that was announced in the program. So we'll, we'll do our best to, to cover one topic and to cover and to cover as much as we can on the second one. Uh, I have already given to the organizers the materials that I promised uh, to give yesterday. I hope that you will have them soon. Have you got them? Yes. Excellent. Very well. Very well. So, uh, I'm confident that the materials will help you to perform even better during the summer school and during the competition. Today, we... Come on. Ah, it's not working. So work manually. Today, we're going to discuss the... Today we're going to discuss the, the sources of international law and we'll proceed to the law of treaties in the second part of the class. Yesterday we discussed the notion of international law. We have explored to some extent the relationship between international law with politics because law is a product of political processes. So all law be it domestic or be it international, is made through political processes, by political actors, for political goals. We have uh, said that there certainly is a relationship between law and ethics, because all law is ethical, as far as it reflects the values that are predominant in a given society. We have hinted that some law including international law, has a connection with, with religion. Well, international law definitely had a strong religious component in the past. You may know that in the antiquity, international treaties, when they were made, they were made by the authority of, of the gods of the respective peoples. And the kings, the rulers, when they made, signed the treaties, they swore by the authority of their respective gods to, uh, to, convince, to convince their partners that treaties would be complied with. In the contemporary world, at least some international law is still religious. That is Islamic international law. So religious does have a role to play uh, in its relationship with international law, even in the contemporary world. However, the probably the most adequate vision of international law is that expressed in the 1970s by Professor Grigory Punkin to the effect that international law is a coordinated will of states. So it is not simply a sum of the wills of different states but rather international law is a product of their coordination. It's uh, to the extent that international law, be it treaty-based law or be it customary international law, it is always a product of states coming together and agreeing upon certain rules that will apply uh, with respect to certain spheres of, of states' future cooperation. And today, we'll discuss a very important topic. What are the sources of international law? In other words, what are the forms in which rules of international law exist? Yesterday, we had a very useful discussion about the, uh, about the relationship between rules and norms. And our colleagues said that norms are filled with rules. Or in other words, rules are the content of norms of law. So, today's class is exactly about this. What are the forms in which rules of international law can be found? Well, I am sure you, you know this very well. This is Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, which is 
universally regarded as uh, the, uh, the, so the source that lists sources of international law. You know them very well. These are international conventions, international custom, the general principles of law, plus judicial decisions and the teachings of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations as subsidiary means for the determination of rules of law. It seems to be easy. Yet let us devote some time to looking at these and other sources of international law that uh, gained in importance after the adoption of the statute of the ICJ. Well, this statute will soon be 100 years of age, and international law, of course, continued developing after the statute was adopted. So, as of now, there also are other sources of international law that are not exactly listed here, or else which are implied by this list. So, the very first source of international law which is listed in Article 38 of the ICJ statute are international conventions, that is, treaties. What is a treaty? Yes, please. It is agreement between two states. Thank you. As, as simple, simple as that. It is agreement. Well said. Yes, please. Thank you. What you have said is very important. So it is an agreement between states. Uh, some agreements are subject to ratification, not all of them, but some. And very importantly, in order to be effective, treaties have to be effective at the, interna uh, at, at the domestic level. Yes, please. Treaties are agreements signed by parties which are signatories and uh, which pose some legal rights and obligation to be adhered to by the parties. Excellent. Treaties contain rights and obligations of the parties, yet there seems to be a slight disagreement uh, between the two opinions. Uh, you have said the treaties are signed, and you have said the treaties are ratified. We'll come back to this important issue in the second part of the class. Indeed, some treaties are subject to signature, others are subject to ratification. Uh, um, and also, they are um, uh, in a um, written form. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, whether um, body, uh, um, one instrument or two or more, and uh, whatever is particular uh, designation. And um, that's according to the um, Article 2, I guess, of the, uh, uh, the Vienna Convention on the Law Treaties. Thank you. So indeed, treaties can have different titles. And the title of a treaty would not affect its legal force. A treaty may consist of one or more texts. And indeed, there is a treaty that itself regulates the conclusion, application, suspension, and termination of treaties, which is called the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And we'll have a look at some provisions of this treaty in the second part of the class. Excellent. So this could be more or less it as, a, uh, as an introductory overview of treaties. We'll have a closer look at them later on. Very well, let's go on. The second source of international law that is mentioned in Article 38 of the ICJ statute is international custom. What is international custom? Well, uh, explain us. Okay, so international custom is state practice and uh, plus union juris, as we see on the screen. So state practice should be um, proved by opinion juris. So 
that means that this exactly case is used by several states and nobody doubts that it should be used. Mm -hmm. So opinion yours is um, improvement of states of the uh, of use of this custom. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In other words, it, international custom is an unwritten rule of international law that is embodied in the practice of states, not in what they may have written into a treaty, but rather it's a rule that states follow in their actual behavior, in their actual conduct, and that they regard as a rule of law. Sometimes international custom is confused with another thing. Comitas gentium. Ever heard of it? Uh, Comitas gentium or the so-called international committee or international politeness are also unwritten rules which apply to the behavior of states, but unlike international custom, comitas gentium is mere politeness. These are not rules of law. They are not mandatory. Uh, if a state violates a rule of comitas gentium, there will be no state responsibility. However, for violations of rules of customary international law, state responsibility arises. And we'll discuss it in the in our fourth class. I think you had a point to make. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, also I uh, want to add that state practice should be general, and being curious means that the state is conscious, uh, conscious that uh, if they behave and they, uh, in such a way, they are obliged with this customary rule. Thank you. This issue of the generality of state practice requires some clarification. That the state practice has to be general does not mean that it has to be universal. Uh, means that if a rule has to become one of customary international law, it has to be accepted by, the, by a majority of states, not necessarily by all states. Uh, then again, let's imagine that we are states if we have to introduce a rule of customary law among ourselves that all guys have to come dressed in suits and wear ties. So it does not mean that all gentlemen in this classroom have to be dressed like this. It will be sufficient if most will be dressed like this. Or vice versa, uh, well, currently, currently uh, there, is no, there is no basis for the introduction of, the, of, this, of this rule of customary law among ourselves at all, because none of us is wearing a tie. It means, it means that we are all, in fact, objecting to the introduction of this rule. And this leads me to another important notion that you please have to be aware of. Persistent objector. What is persistent objector? Exactly. So, since we are all currently objecting to wearing ties, uh, means that we are against the introduction of this very rule of 
customary law among ourselves, and the same is true with states. If a state persistently objects to a rule or to an emerging rule of customary international law, this rule will not be applicable to that state unless it becomes one of uh, general international law as a peremptory norm. We'll uh, very soon we'll consider what peremptory norms of general international law are. Very well. Uh, it also has to be said that custom does not always have to be universal or general. Custom can also be regional. Uh, because, uh, because values are different in different regions of the world, because traditions are different, so there can be also local or regional rules of customary international law on different continents in, uh, uh, among states whose peoples profess different religions, and that is normal. Next. The next source of international law that is directly referred to in Article 38 of the ICJ statute are general principles of law. What are these? What's a general principle of law? Any ideas? Yes, please. Uh, this is a rule that can place uh, Oh, okay. Uh, can we try to make this definition more specific? Well, this is basically the foundation of the law itself. It is established through the state practice, not even the state practice, but like the whole existence of the law. So basically, we have the general principles of law, and we have the, general, the principles of international law, and we have to distinguish them. So the general principles of law, they encompass more rights here of law, and the principles of international law, they uh, are basically they are applied to the international relations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. In other words, general principles of law are rules that tell us that what law is, what law is about. Uh, general principles of law tell us that rules of international law are indeed rules of law and not of ethics, not of politics, not of religion. This source is particularly valuable when, for example, an international court or parties to a relationship have to establish that a rule in question is one of law. Then they uh, apply to the rule in question these very principles to test the rule against uh, its nature, to, in order to establish its nature. Uh, just to give you an example, Lex Specialis derogat. Yeah. Exactly. This is an example of a general principle of law that a special law derogates the general law. That is, if there is, uh, if there is a general rule of law and a more specific one, and both apply to the same relationship, then the more specific rule has to apply. So, if, if you are ever confronted with two rules of international law, both of which apply to a given situation, and you will be asked which of the two rules you will have to apply, be sure to apply the, the specific rule, the more specific rule, because there is this principle of law that applies universally in, uh, in the major legal systems of the world, and to the effect that if there are two competing rules of law, the more specific has to prevail. And there are many other general principles of law like this. Of course, this is, a, this is an example from the Roman law that entered international law. But there are many examples of rules like this that apply to the system of international law as a whole, to 
show that international law is law, although peculiar. And here we come to probably the most interesting part in Article 38 of the, of the statute. Judicial decisions and the teachings of the most highly qualified publicists. Is this also a source of international law, in your opinion? So this is a subsidiary secondary law that is uh, related to interpret the main, uh, uh, the main uh, sources. Thank you. Uh, there often is a confusion to the effect that judicial decisions and the teachings of publicists are also referred to or understood as a source of international law. They are not. There are only three sources of international law which are referred to as such in Article 38 of the ICJ Statute. Treaties, international custom, plus the general principles of law, and that's it. And indeed, as our colleague pointed out, the judicial decisions or the teachings uh, of the most highly qualified publicists, they are not source, sources of international law as such, but, and it's written black on white in Article 38, that they are subsidiary means for the determination of the rules of law. So please do not treat judicial decisions and international legal doctrine on the same level as general principles of law, international custom, and, interna uh, and international treaties, because these do not create rules of international law. Rather, the doctrine and judicial decisions interpret the existing rules of international law. Of course, international courts can promote the emergence of new rules of international law. That's correct, and we'll be discussing this tomorrow. Of course, any great idea of international law in the very first instance emerges in the mind of, in, of an international legal scholar. And in that sense, that scholar is the originator of a future rule of international law. But no scholar and no international court creates the rule of international law. They simply interpret the existing rules, or else they can prompt the emergence of future rules of international law. And now let us discuss a couple of sources which are not listed in Article 38 of the, of the statute. But nonetheless, they create obligations of states. They create rights and duties of states, and therefore they have to be taken into account. Unilateral acts of states. What's that? I, I see that you have an idea. Does anyone here have an idea what unilateral acts of states are? As an idea. Just think of this formula, unilateral act of a state. Yes, please. First, unilateral, it means that it is only Exactly. Thank you very much. Unilateral acts are, are those which are performed by one state only, without a, a relationship existing with another state, with a counterpart. That is, unilateral acts are not uh, treaties, they are not international custom. They are really performed by one state expressing the will of this one state regarding a particular matter. Any more opinions? Then I will approach our friend here. Yeah, so uh, uh, these are the acts that have uh, legal implications. Uh, so some of the, uh, the political ones or, or, or the social ones only 
uh, the uh, legal implications. And so these are, for example, unilateral you know, uh, declarations of states made in oral or, or uh, the written form. Um, and also, I'm, uh, I, um, I have heard that uh, this is not the source of law, but this is the source of an obligation um, of, um, of the states. Thank you. Well, in, a, in as much as uh, the content of any legal relationship is the rights and obligations of subjects of a given branch of law, uh, unilateral acts of states are certainly sources of international law, but applicable to, uh, to the state performing this act uh, only. Yes, please. Thank you. So, indeed, we are talking about legal obligations of states, not about uh, political ones that create no legal consequences. Unilateral acts of states are legally significant in as much as through an act performed by a competent authority, the state itself is obliged, undertakes an obligation through the act performed by that competent authority. Yes, and it has to comply with the international law and with the conventions and obligations that were taken by the state by its previous interstate treaties and um, by the, uh, it, it has to comply with the general principles of law uh, in order for it to be lawful. And uh, as just the, as uh, Linda said, that uh, the, the state will be responsible for this unilateral act if it was made either by authority, uh, by, this, by the uh, president or by the head of the state, or if it was made by the private um, individuals and private bodies, but if they were authorized to by the state. Exactly. Just to give, to give you a couple of examples of unilateral acts of states, oh, declaration is one. So a state is allowed to make a declaration on an issue of international law that considers important for itself. Another type of unilateral acts of states was discussed yesterday, recognition. A state is free to recognize or not to recognize another state. So, recognition is another type of unilateral acts of states which, which is very typical. Another typical unilateral act of states is protest. A state can protest against uh, an emerging rule of customary international law by way of applying the persistent objector rule or else a state can object by uh, can object to a demarche uh, undertaken by another state. It can object against a publication which defames it or, or against anything else. So, to wrap up, unilateral acts of states are important in as much as they interplay indeed with other obligations of states embodied in their respective treaties or else in customary international law. Next, we have to take into account resolutions adopted by various international organizations by various international organs, uh, which are collectively referred to as soft law. There, are, there certainly are two types of resolutions that, that have to be distinguished. There are binding resolutions, such as those adopted by the Security Council of the United Nations, and this is, this is hard law. That is, because the Security Council of the UN is the only body of the United Nations that issues decisions which are binding upon all member states of the United Nations, certainly its resolutions are regarded as hard law. 
But most resolutions adopted by various international organizations, international organs, regional institutions, belong to the so-called soft law. Why is it soft? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Indeed, rules of soft law are not binding. Most of the time they're recommendations, and a violation of such a rule would not most of the time entail the responsibility of a state. Uh, the most obvious example are resolutions of the General Assembly of the United Nations. However, please do not be misled by this general assumption that resolutions of the General Assembly are not binding at all. There are resolutions of the General Assembly which are binding, in fact. Uh, setting aside resolutions on the budget, which are binding uh, by definition, yet there can be, there are resolutions of the General Assembly which are binding because they reflect or they contain binding rules of international law. There are some resolutions that contain or reproduce existing rules of international law, of hard international law, and the General Assembly does it or adopts such resolutions containing binding rules of international law in particularly important situations. Let me give an example, or let me uh, remind you of an example that all of you know. On the 27th of March 2014, the General Assembly adopted Resolution 262 on the situation in Ukraine. Uh, uh, have you read it? Uh, if not, please read that resolution in as much as it pertains to your country. That resolution uh, reaffirmed the territorial integrity of Ukraine, reaffirmed the invalidity of the so-called referendum in Crimea, and that very resolution is full of binding rules of international law. So, this resolution is an example of uh, a resolution adopted by the General Assembly that cannot at all be regarded as non-binding. Uh, be, please be aware that the General Assembly may adopt binding resolutions in as much as these contain uh, or reproduce existing mandatory rules of international law. Equity is another concept that we have to be aware of. What's equity? Someone said justice. Yes, and I'm coming to you. Uh, equity it is uh, justice, and uh, it means that, uh, uh, for example, if I want to fly to equity, for example, control and some other kinds of equity, which, for example, the court may use uh, uh, in their decisions. Thank you very much. Anything to add to this? Please read about equity in the, in the textbooks on, on international law that you, that you have. Uh, and please use this concept in your future pleadings at the Jessup competition. You will see that you will impress the judges greatly. Equity simply means the act of being fair and impartial in the judicial proceedings. Thank you. Uh, in other words, equity is about fairness. 
It's about, uh, it's about establishing the rights and duties of parties fairly and faithfully. It's about requiring of parties what is possible and not requiring of them what is impossible. It's about not requiring of a, of a small and not powerful state the same as what would be required of a big and powerful state. And last but not least, Hugh Scoggins, highlighted in red at the very top of the, of the column on the right. Hugh Scoggins was already mentioned today at least once as peremptory norms of general international law. This concept is to be found in Article 53 of the Vienna Convention uh, on the Law of Treaties. And what does it mean? Peremptory norms of general international law. <laughs> Let me come to you. Exactly. That's why it's at the very top of the right column. And that's why it's highlighted in red. Peremptory norms of general international law are they're sometimes referred to as constitutional norms of, of international law, which is technically not quite correct. This term is simply used to denote the superior status of these rules of international law in the hierarchy of, of rules. Because in domestic legal orders, rules of constitutions, they do enjoy the superior status. Although constitutions do not exist in all states of the world. Uh, quite correct. Use organs, peremptory norms of general international law, they're so important that no rule of international law not having the same status can beat them. All treaty-based or customary rules of international law are subordinated to use codes. No treaty can be superior to a rule of use codes. No rule of customary international law can be above it. An existing rule, uh, an existing peremptory norm of general international law can only be replaced by a subsequent rule having the same character. So, only Euskogans can modify Euskogans. Can, can we think of examples of such rules? Uh, it's maybe uh, prohibited of uh, murdering or another inhuman violation, for example, for any human, because uh, the right on life is uh, uh, not almost. Uh, but the right of uh, freedom, the right of uh, uh, humanity, integrity is uh, almost and it can be violated in any case. Uh, this is an example of this problem. Thank you. Uh, in other words, torture is prohibited. You have mentioned the keyword dignity. Uh, probably there is no greater uh, infringement of human dignity that, uh, than, than torture. Torture is prohibited and the prohibition of torture is an example of, uh, of use codes. 
Thank you. Uh, or else you Scoggins encompasses the prohibition of aggression, the prohibition of slavery and slave trade, the prohibition of apartheid, and uh, some other rules. Unfortunately, there is no single source of international law where all rules of Euskogans could be found. There is no catalog of uh, peremptory norms of general international law. I think that the International Law Commission would do a good job if it ever undertook this task to codify rules of, uh, of use coggins. Uh, currently, such rules are scattered throughout various documents of the International Law Commission, uh, throughout various decisions and advisory opinions of the International Court of Justice, but they're not catalogued. So, uh, if you ever have to refer to the rules of use Coggins, you will have to do a job of researching the relevant sources of international law, the relevant judicial decisions and international legal doctrine, and make your case. Because if you do so, if you make your case by relying on a rule of use Coggins, your case will be very powerful. And so, con to conclude, to conclude on this subject. This could be a tentative chart of uh, the system of international law. And thereby I am linking yesterday's class with today's one. The general part of international law could encompass the sources of public international law, the law of treaties that we'll soon proceed to discussing the relationship between international law and municipal law. By the way, yesterday I requested you to look into the issue of monist and dualist theories. Have you done so? Please do, if not yet done. Uh, yesterday we also discussed the subjects of public international law. We have mentioned territory as one of the constituent elements of statehood. Well, and we'll discuss later in the course the status of natural persons in public international law. All these matters relate to the general part of international law, and well, by now we have had, uh, we have made an overview of it. By contrast, the special part of international law contains various branches that regulate more specific relations between states through treaties or through customary international law. We'll, uh, later in the course, we'll focus particularly on international humanitarian law and the elements of international criminal law. We'll uh, have a look at some elements of the law of international security because humanitarian law and the law of international security go together. And certainly we'll, uh, we'll have a class on the law of international responsibility. It will be on Thursday. Do you have any questions on this part of the class? For now, mm. everything's clear. <laughs> okay. Then now we'll make a break, as you have asked me to do, and in two minutes we'll continue with the law of treaties. It is time to continue, and in, in the next 55 minutes we'll try to cover the basics of the law of treaties. Uh, why do we have to have a separate class on this issue? Because treaties are well, the main source of international law nowadays. Because most rights and obligations of states are currently reflected in treaties. Although this has not always been the case, and although treaties do not necessarily possess a predominant legal force. By the way, uh, what is legally more powerful, international custom or treaties? In other words, which of the two has a greater legal force, international custom or treaties? And why? <laughs> 
Yes, please. I think specifically none of them really has a greater force on the other, but it all depends. Usually when you have a treaty between states, then I think the treaty is applicable. But when a treaty doesn't exist, then a custom could be used because based on laws of international armed conflict, custom could be used to state even <coughs> signatories to these customs. Thank you. And this is this is a good view. Technically, treaties and international custom have an equal legal force. Uh, among treaties, only one has a superior legal force, and that is the Charter of the United Nations. The Charter provides specifically that if it, com if it should conflict with another treaty, the Charter will prevail. Yet, as for the rest, the uh, treaties and international custom have an equal legal force. Moreover, there is an interplay between treaties and custom. Over time, international custom can overtake or take precedence over an existing treaty. Vice versa, by contrast, rules of custom or international law can be integrated within a treaty and uh, thus be codified and become more specific. What is, what's the problem about custom? Well, there are many problems about it, but one of them is uniformity, the uniformity of state practice. In order for a rule of international law to be clear, the state practice has to be uniform. Uh, certain deviations from uniformity would not breach this uniformity as such, but uh, Nonetheless, a, an unwritten rule of international law can be unclear, more or less. Of course, treaty rules are clearer, and if a customary rule of international law is codified in a treaty, well, this, will, this may contribute to its efficiency. So, treaty and custom do interplay. They uh, penetrate each other, so to say. Yet. None of them technically has a greater legal force. We'll have, we'll have a look at the law of treaties, at some major provisions of the 1969 Vienna Convention on, uh, on the Law of Treaties, in order to see how this very important source of international law, treaties, how they're made, how they are complied with, how they're suspended, and how, how they're terminated. Let me say a word of caution. This presentation will by no means replace your reading of the Convention and your reading of commentaries to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Please do read both the Convention and the commentaries. Among the materials that you have, there is an authoritative commentary as thick as that, as thick as that uh, on each and every article of the Convention, so you, you will be very well prepared to uh, to the event. <coughs> What's a treaty? A treaty is an international agreement, as we said in the first part of this class, concluded between states in written form and governed by international law, whether embodied in a single instrument or in two or more related instruments and whatever its particular designation. This is Article 2 of the Vienna Convention. This definition contains uh, some important elements that we have to pay attention to. Certainly, it is an agreement that is concluded by states. And here we, uh, we can ask ourselves, but what about treaties concluded between states and international organizations? or between international organizations? The answer is, yes, there are such treaties, but this convention does not apply to them. There is a separate convention that regulates treaties concluded between states and international organizations, or else between international organizations. That convention was adopted in 1986. So, 
the Vienna Convention of 1969 only regulates treaties concluded between states. Uh, a treaty that is governed by the convention has to be concluded in, in writing, although uh, some treaties can also be concluded orally, but the Vienna Convention does not regulate. A treaty has to be governed by international law. And here let me ask you what this means. What does it mean that a treaty is governed by international law? Good point, but it can be even better. Uh, what else can it be governed by, if not by international law? The answer, the answer is nothing. Uh, in other words, a treaty is only governed by international law. But, of course, states can also conclude other agreements which are not governed by international law. Example. A state can conclude commercial contracts. A state can conclude labor contracts with, with people who work for the state. These are also agreements, but they are not governed by international law. They are governed respectively by civil law, by commercial law, by labor law. So they are not treaties. A treaty is governed by international law in as much as it is about an issue of international law. Labor or commercial transactions are not issues of international law. They're issues of private international law, as we discussed yesterday. They're issues of international commercial law, but they're not ones of public international law. So a treaty is an agreement about an issue or issues of public international law. As we discussed today, a treaty may consist of a single instrument or of multiple instruments which are related together. And a treaty can have different designations. It can be called a treaty, an agreement, a convention, a covenant, a pact, a protocol, an optional protocol, an additional protocol, a memorandum, whatever. The legal force of a treaty is not affected by its title. If you're ever asked to compare the legal force of a protocol or a convention or a covenant, be sure to say that the legal force is equal, because the legal force of a treaty does not depend on its title. <coughs> Treaties are different. They can be concluded between states, between governments, between agencies of states, such as interministerial treaties. For example, uh, a treaty between the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine and the Ministry of Education and Science of the Republic of Kazakhstan. So, these are all treaties, simply concluded, concluded at different, different level of, levels of authority. What about the legal force of these treaties? Uh, is the legal force of these three types of treaties different in your opinion, or is it the same? There is, there is a hierarchy. There is a hierarchy. Why so? The highest place in the hierarchy takes the interest in treaties. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. So, do you want to say that a treaty between the Ministry of Education and Science of Ukraine and between the Ministry of Education and Science of the Republic of Kazakhstan, for example, well, has an insignificant legal force? Um, no, I, I don't think that it has insignificant legal force, but I do believe that it has fewer legal force than, um, than the interesting treaties that that are adopted and were signed by the president by the heads of the states. Thank you. Uh, of course, an exact answer to this question would depend on a particular situation, but my counter-argument to you 
would be the lex specialis deroga generalis. So, presidents, heads of states, heads of government, they usually conclude only the most important treaties of a general nature. However, uh, the treaty, an example of which I gave to you, is a, is a, is a specific one. So, because such a treaty between the ministries of, of education and science of the two countries should regulate specific matters, I would not diminish its legal force. Simply, this is a specific treaty that should regulate specific matters that other state, state bodies would, would simply not go into. No. The legal force of such a treaty is, uh, is important, is no less significant than, uh, than that of other treaties. Simply, <clears throat> uh, the competence of the respective bodies concluding the treaties would be different. A president would not sign a treaty between the ministries uh, of education and science. A president would put his or her signature on a more general, more programmatic treaty, whereas a treaty like this would be left up to the competence of a specific minister. Uh, treaties can also be classified by the number of parties that participate in them. There are bilateral treaties applicable between two states and there are multilateral treaties applicable between three or more states. What about their legal force? Which, whichever is more powerful, a multilateral treaty or, or a bilateral one and why? bilateral or multilateral treaty, it just does mean that uh, this, for example, bilateral treaty is uh, uh, obligatory for those two states who ratified mm -hmm. this treaty and uh, <coughs> the same is respectively, uh, respectively with multilateral treaty. So it will be binding for those three or more states who ratified this tre treaty. Thank you. Let me make just one slight correction. Uh, ratification, so ratification, or else signature, or else approval, are all different modes of for expressing a state's consent to a treaty. So uh, a treaty does not necessarily have to be ratified. Let's <clears throat> let's put it differently. Any treaty that has entered into force for a specific state has legal force for this state and indeed both multilateral treaties and bilateral treaties of a state possess an, e an equal legal force. Ideally they, sh they should not contradict one another. <coughs> Sorry, but if they do, if they do contradict one another, then the issue of interpretation of a treaty arises. Then a state will be confronted with the need to explain this contradiction to do something about it, to uh, smoothen the contradiction so as to make the application of both conflicting treaties uh, possible. And here's the matter that, uh, that we have to make clear for ourselves. States have different modes of expressing consent to a treaty at their disposal. States may consent to a treaty by signature, by, re by ratification, by acceptance or approval, by exchange of instruments, or by accession. These modes of expressing consent to a treaty are listed in the, uh, in the 1969 Vienna Convention. Let us uh, uh, let us try to understand quickly what each of these modes means. What is signature? And let me go again to the uh, to this part of the class. I'd like to hear your voices. So, what is understood by signature? What do we mean that when we say that a treaty is signed? 
Any ideas? Acceptable? Yes. Uh, one of the key signs uh, when there are um, some uh, people with a certain disorder to the sign is tricky and uh, they put their signature on the text of the treaty and then uh, requires legal force. As simple as this. In every state, there are officials who are empowered by the domestic law of this state to sign treaties on behalf of the state. These are usually heads of state, heads of government, uh, and uh, chiefs of the respective ministries or agencies who are, who are empowered to sign treaties on behalf of the respective ministries or agencies. A treaty concluded by signature can enter into force immediately after signature if it provides so, or else it may require subsequent ratification. What is their ratification? That's easy. You raise the hand? No? Yes. <coughs> Publication, no. Thank you. In other words, ratification is approval, so to say, of a treaty by, usually by the parliament, uh, of a treaty that was previously signed on behalf of, uh, of a state. Uh, many states of the world have domestic laws on international treaties and these laws specify which treaties are subject to ratification. Usually these are treaties that concern human rights of their nationals, treaties on military cooperation, treaties that require changes to be made to the domestic laws. So, of course, such treaties, they are subject to ratification, that is, approval by representative bodies uh, of, of a given state, by the parliament. Uh, in turn, every treaty itself has to specify when it will enter into force immediately after signature or after ratification, or else if it is a multilateral treaty, how many ratifications the treaty should require to enter into force. For example, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court required how many ratifications to enter into force? 60. Oh. And how many ratifications did the Geneva Conventions for the Protection of Victims of War require to enter into force? Only two. The Geneva, Conven uh, the Geneva Conventions of 1949 only required two ratifications to enter into force. Why so? This was done on purpose to make the conventions immediately applicable in the likely event of an armed conflict. So, uh, the conventions were designed in such a way as to make them applicable at least between these two states that would have ratified them should, it, should an international armed conflict start between them. Consent to a treaty can also be expressed by acceptance or approval. What's that? <coughs> Who could accept or approve a treaty? <clears throat> That's easy. Uh, this is answered in the respective domestic laws on international treaties within a state. Acceptance or approval is usually done by the government. For instance, or if an interministerial treaty is concluded, for example, between the ministries of education and science, such a treaty may require acceptance or approval by the government. Because, 
it's not only up to the Ministry of Education and Science to comply with this treaty. The Ministry of Finance would also be involved because it's about money. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs could also be involved because uh, a treaty between the Ministries of Education and Science could be about exchange of students or exchange of faculty and this would require visas or uh, by contrast visa exemptions etc. Consent by exchange of instruments. What's that? Yes, please. On one point of view, it's a greener best profitable for all stages. So from this exchange, they will receive some credit for a day, for them, I think so. Mm -hmm. And that has to be Aha. Uh -huh. what, what an interesting idea, the profitability of treaties. Actually, this, this mechanism means something more specific, but I liked very much your idea of treaties being profitable. In fact, all international law is profitable. International law is about benefits that states gain from cooperation with one another. Cooperation can be bilateral or multilateral, but just think of it. Sometimes international law is viewed as a factor of restraint upon states. Sometimes they say that international law limits their freedom, but no, international law is a, is a tool to make relationships between states more orderly, more predictable, safer, and in that sense, more profitable and more beneficial. International law is about making possible the predictability of states' behavior. And thus, it's about making, uh, making all relations between states more beneficial. Thank you very much for this. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. So exchange of instruments is ex exchange of uh, diplomatic notes, mm -hmm. yes? So it's exchange of diplomatic notes, and uh, in uh, when states do that, um, it means that they express their consent. So that is simple. I just was not sure that it's exchange of diplomatic notes, but it is. <laughs> Thank you. It can be exchange of diplomatic notes or exchange of instruments of ratification, instruments of approval. Uh, simply, states may have to agree that. After ratification or after acceptance or approval, the, uh, their respective ministries of foreign affairs would send to their counterparts in another state the instruments to be agree uh, agreed upon to, so that the, the other state, the counterpart, has a written proof that the treaty has indeed been ratified or uh, that it has been approved or accepted. And finally, there is consent by accession. What's accession? Uh, can you explain this? How do you mean it? This is a great example of uh, the multiplicity of meanings of terms in, in law. Uh, please, be, please be sure to use the international legal terminology in its exact sense. Because if you, it is possible that a term might have multiple meanings. And in the law of treaties, accession means something very different. But your example was very good for our pedagogical purposes. Yes, let us give it another try. I think the consent by session is made by the state who is not the initial creator of the treaty and who at one time decided to 
says that he's the Ukrainian way of not is mm -hmm. uh, to the international treaty and then he uses one of his uh, most consumers mm -hmm. consent by signature or other words. Exactly. This is a mode of expressing consent that only applies to multilateral treaties. Accession does not apply to bilateral treaties because it simply is impossible, technically impossible there. Accession is a process whereby a state accedes, that is, joins a treaty that was previously concluded by other states and that, that has entered into force among those other states. Very well. So these are the most typical modes for a state to express consent to a treaty. But let us remember two things. That first, a treaty itself always provides the, which mechanism for its entry into force would apply. And second, a state would always conclude an international treaty in accordance with its, with its domestic legislation. In a state, there usually is a law on, on treaties that provides exactly who is authorized to sign, to ratify, to accept or approve a treaty, how this is done, uh, so all the procedure is there. We have to be aware that there is such a thing as reservations. What's a reservation? A reservation is a unilateral statement. So this is another example of a unilateral act. However phrased or named, made by a state, when signing, ratifying, accepting, approving, or acceding to a treaty, whereby it purports to exclude or to modify the legal effect of certain provisions of the treaty in their application to that state. This is another quote from Article 2 of the 1969 Vienna Convention. Uh, in other words, reservations are a tool, again, applicable only to multilateral treaties, because they make no sense uh, with respect to bilateral treaties. When two states uh, are about to conclude a bilateral treaty, they discuss all the provisions of the treaty as such. So it makes no sense to make a reservation to a bilateral treaty. This mechanism is only possible uh, with respect to treaties that involve three or more parties. The purpose of a reservation is to somehow modify one or more provisions of a treaty in its, in its or their application to that, to, that, to that very state. Why are reservations useful, let me ask you? Why is it useful to make a reservation to a treaty? Why would a state want to make a reservation? is a kind of warning by the state that uh, this uh, uh, treaty will be applicable to this state only if uh, some provisions uh, won't be applied to this state. And uh, it's a kind of um, warning, a good warning, uh, that is a kind of proof that this treaty won't um, won't be uh, mislead by other states or it won't be used by other states against this very state. I don't know how to uh, explain it properly by law language. So. Uh, that, that was a good attempt. The purpose of a, reser of a reservation is to uh, shield a state against certain undesirable consequences of a treaty. A uh, state may want to uh, be a party to a treaty, but at the same time it may want to prevent certain consequences that this treaty may entail for itself. For instance, uh, 
state may want to enact certain provisions of a treaty only after a certain period of time, or else it may want to limit the application of a treaty to uh, a particular part of its territory, although usually treaties apply to the whole territory of a state, or else a state may want to exclude certain groups of people from the, uh, from the field of application of a treaty. So reservations are egoistic provisions in that sense. Um, I would also say that uh, they are used in order to make the, uh, the agreement more um, flexible mm -hmm. or to, uh, to adjust uh, the, uh, the, uh, the agreement uh, to the special uh, circumstances or to the features of the state. So. so that's a positive way to, to look at reservations. Yes, please. These are basically expression of the views of state to protect its own interests uh -huh. in case setting conditions are not met. Uh -huh. Good. Uh, for example, as I see, it is also very <coughs> like some treaties or some conventions, they may prescribe the two modes of uh, international behavior. I mean, for example, there is the International Labor Organization, and uh, they adopted the convention, uh, for example, if the company is in, in bankrupt. So uh, the order of the payment, the procedure of conducting the payment to be in place. Mm -hmm. And this convention is described two ways of conducting those payments. And when Ukraine uh, ratified this convention, it prescribed in, in her reservation that it would comply only with the second mode of conducting this payment. So it is for the better of the state, it just shows how much the state is able to comply with it. Excellent. That is, uh, that's it. That is exactly, exactly it. Reservations, on the one hand, help states to uh, guard themselves against certain consequences of treaties, and on the other hand, they make certain treaty provisions specifically applicable or specifically suited to the current circumstances within, within a given state. <coughs> Please note, Reservations may not affect the object or purpose of the treaty in question. This is very important. Uh, reservations may be, may be about many technicalities. They, they, they can be about the modes of payment, payments to be made. They can be about the range of people affected. They can be about uh, specific organs within the state who will be in charge of, uh, in, of executing the treaty. But reservations may never affect the very object and purpose of the treaty in question. Because if this were the case, the very validity of the treaty in question would be threatened. If, this, if a state made a reservation affecting the object or the purpose of the treaty, well, this could effectively mean that the state is just uh, signed or ratified or accepted the treaty just for the facade, not without a real intention to comply with the treaty, just for its own image. Therefore, international law prohibits uh, states from making reservations affecting uh, the objects and purposes of treaties. <clears throat> the entry into force of a treaty, this is very important. When does a treaty enter into force? This is usually uh, prescribed in the treaty itself. Uh, for instance, a treaty may stipulate that it would enter into force immediately after signature or after two ratifications, as is the case with the 1949 Geneva Conventions, or a treaty may require a certain number of ratifications or a treaty may stipulate that it would enter into force after a certain number of days after, for example, 60 ratifications were made. What's important here is that a state is only obliged under a treaty, or conversely has acquires rights under a treaty, only once the treaty enters into force for that state. 
In other words, when you will be analyzing your compromis, please pay careful attention to the exact date of entering the force of a certain treaty for, for the state in question. It may be, <coughs> it may be in the compromis that uh, some obligations that you think have a reason for, for a given state have not indeed a reason for it yet because of the procedure of this agreement's entry into force. In other words, a state only acquires rights and obligations under a certain treaty after the treaty enters into force under it, not before. So, before the entry into force of a treaty, a state is not obliged under the treaty and has no rights under the treaty. That's why the determination of the exact date of a treaty's entry into force is crucial. It's absolutely crucial. And the next point is one that the faith mentioned, publication. Uh, why, is, why is the publication of a treaty important? The publication of a treaty is important for the clarification, mm -hmm. and so that everyone will be able to see it and see the terms mm -hmm. and adhere to it without any misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a, that's a good way to put it. Uh, states usually publish their, their treaties in collections, in official collections of records, in official collections of treaties. Uh, this is done with the purpose of making it clear that the treaty, uh, no, this is done with the purpose of making the treaty available to everyone concerned, to the organs of a state, to judges who may want to rely on the provisions of a given treaty, to legal entities and to individuals who may also want to rely on the provisions of a, uh, of a given treaty uh, in their different contracts, in their different litigations. Importantly, treaties should also be registered at the Secretariat of the United Nations. Please note that this registration would not affect the legal force of such a treaty. If a treaty is not registered at the Secretariat of the UN, it will not become invalid in legal terms. Simply, states have usually register their treaties at the Secretariat of the United Nations in order to be able to rely upon the treaties in the various organs of the UN. For, in, for instance, in the International Court of Justice or in the United Nations Security Council. So, registration at the UN is not a condition for making treaties valid. No, it's a condition for states to rely upon the treaties in the various organs of the United Nations. <coughs> How do treaties apply? They apply in accordance with the principle as Michael put it, pacta sunt servanda. <clears throat> treaties have to be complied with in good faith. That's the, that's the meaning of this principle. Uh, means that because international law is a law of coordination, because treaties are entered into voluntarily it is a legitimate expectation of states, parties to a treaty, that their counterparts would comply with the treaty in good faith. Pacta sunt servanda is a fundamental principle of international law. In fact, international law cannot, cannot exist without this principle. Because there is no superior authority in international law that could enforce treaties. There is no international police that could be addressed if a treaty is violated. There, are <coughs> there is no international court with a universal mandatory jurisdiction that could enforce treaty. Yes, there are regional courts with 
semantic jurisdictions such as the European Court of Human Rights. But this court is, uh, the competence of this court is limited geographically. Yes, there is the International Court of Justice, but as you know, its jurisdiction is not, is not mandatory. And many states of the world are, have not accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the, of the ICJ. And even if the ICJ rules in a dispute between states, the decision of the ICJ will be, uh, will be binding only upon the parties to a given dispute, only upon these two states that have a dispute between them. Therefore, it is crucial to comply with treaties in good faith and to avoid disputes as far as possible. But should a dispute arise, then in the resolution of the dispute, parties would rely upon the provisions of the treaty. What about the application of successive treaties? Let's imagine that Marina and I, as states, have a treaty on a certain issue. And then we conclude another. For, for instance, we have a treaty on trade. And then we decide to conclude another treaty, a later treaty also dealing with trade. Which of the two treaties will apply? The second one. Why? Because it will be in the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, um, in your set of rules. And mm -hmm. it's why it will have, it will have a priority. Mm -hmm. This is, by the way, this is also a general principle of law that a new provision dealing with the same substance prevails over an old provision dealing with the same substance. Exactly. From the moment of entry into force of a new trade agreement between Marina and me, the old treaty will cease to apply. Or else, it may be provided in the new treaty that the new treaty will only cover a part of, uh, mm, of the domain that the previous treaty had been covering. So, in this case, the previous treaty would apply within the limits not covered by the new treaty, and the, new, and the provisions of the new treaty would replace the analogous provisions of the previous treaty. Very well. What about the application of treaties to third states? Yes. If you and I have a treaty, would our treaty affect our friend? Well, the general rule is that the uh, treaty to which a party it can't affect the can't affect the, the third state, but under certain circumstances it can, and such circumstances is provided by the Vienna Convention. Thank you. I have nothing to add. Indeed, if you and I have a treaty, as a rule, this treaty would only affect us, and we may not agree among ourselves that our treaty would affect Dmitri as a state. Only if, only if his state agrees explicitly to such a side effect of our treaty, then our treaty may, might become binding upon him as well. But, as a general rule, Treaties do not create obligations for third states. They only create rights and obligations for their parties. And that's, by the way, a difference, an essential difference between a treaty and a rule of customary international law. The range of participants of treaties is limited to them, whereas rules of customary international law are of a more general obligation. <coughs> 
We have 10 minutes left, and I think we'll just be on time. Treaties are not eternal. Uh, they're not forever. Because circumstances change. Because life goes on. Because situation develops. Uh, because there can be unforeseen changes in circumstances that might so, and all these might require amendments or modifications to be made to treaties. Once a treaty text has been written down, oh, it might not be that way unchanged forever. States parties may agree to amend or to modify the text of a given treaty. What's the difference between amendment and modification? An amendment is a change that is made to the text of a treaty and that, that is agreed upon and concerns all parties to a treaty. For instance, we all have a multilateral treaty applicable among ourselves and we can all agree to amend a treaty so that the new rule, the amended rule, will apply to all of us. Or else, just some of us may want to modify a certain provision of a treaty and that modification will only concern two or three or five states that have agreed upon a modification. And this is interesting. Uh, Marina said some time ago that as a rule, uh, treaty, all treaties have equal legal force and all treaties have to be complied with equally. But what if it may happen? What if two treaties contradict one another? Can be. Uh, or else, what to do if a treaty provision, if there is no contradiction, but within a single treaty, there is a provision of provisions that require clarification. In, in such cases, states have recourse to interpretation of treaty rules. Interpretation means explanation of the meaning of a treaty provision with a view to applying this provision better, more efficiently, more faithfully in accordance with the Pacta Sum Servanda principle. I like that one, uh, that one very much. Uh, there are three main ways to interpret treaties. The textual interpretation, otherwise referred to as literal, means that words in a treaty usually have to be accorded their dictionary meaning. A term, in other words, a term used in a treaty has to be interpreted in accordance with what is meant by it in a dictionary. What's an investment? I am not an investment lawyer, so this is, this is not my field, and I would have a difficulty to explain to you now what, what an investment is. Shame on me. Uh, but if I had to understand what an investment is, I would have to look into a law dictionary, I would have, uh, I would have to look into hmm, legal doctrine, I would have to look into uh, some articles on this subject in order to understand the meaning of this term in accordance with its literal use. What is usually meant by investment among specialists? So, I, not being a specialist in investment law, I would have to refer to an accepted meaning of this word in order to understand what it means, without, without reinventing the wheel. Circum circumstantial interpretation means, usually means uh, recourse to the so-called travaux préparatoires, 
What are these couple? Oh, two hands at a time. Great. What are the couple? It's an official record of process of concluding the treaty. Exactly. Uh, anything to add? Yes, and it is very valuable because the travel repertoire uh, it expresses that the particular state wanted uh, what particular meaning, a particular provision of the treaty the state wanted to give. So, and according to the convention, it uses as the subsidiary means of interpretation and then the primary means of, uh, of interpretation left the text of the treaty ambiguous or controversial. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's it. Sometimes it may be helpful to refer to the official records of a diplomatic conference, for instance, where, where, where a certain treaty was developed, drafted, in order to determine what was meant exactly by this or that term by, by a state that made a proposed a certain provision. So it may be useful to refer to the circumstances of drafting a certain a specific provision of a treaty in order, to, in order to understand what exactly was meant by, by, this, by this or that word. And thirdly, so-called teleological or purpose-related interpretation might be helpful. Uh, states always conclude treaties with certain purposes. I would say with certain purposes in mind, but I'm not sure that states have minds. Uh, However, states certainly have interests, and these interests are always reflected in, uh, in treaties. It may be helpful to try to understand the true purpose for a state to conclude a certain treaty. And anyway, a combination of the three, of the three modalities of interpreting treaties would, in most cases, lead one to a proper interpretation of a treaty rule. <clears throat> and finally, treaties may be, uh, may be invalid, may become invalid in certain cases. Once a treaty is concluded, it's, it applies. If a treaty is of an undetermined duration, it will apply indefinitely until it is terminated. However, in certain circumstances, treaties may become invalid. These are the most typical circumstances uh, for the invalidity of treaties which are listed in the Vienna Convention. Let's start with the first one, uh, because it's the easiest one. Often states refer to their municipal law to invalidate treaties. They say, uh, a treaty, yes, we have concluded it, but now our municipal legislation has changed, and, and so the treaty is, we, we consider the treaty as invalid. The Vienna Convention provides black on white that conflict between a treaty and municipal law is not a ground, let me repeat, it is not a ground for the invalidation of treaties. A state is considered to be bound by a treaty, even if, it cha even if its municipal legislation changes. It is presumed that a state has to continue complying with international law, even if it changes its municipal law. But by contrast, the other four, the other four circumstances are good enough, are sufficient enough to invalidate treaties. For instance, if an error was made during the process of concluding a treaty. If a state representative involved in negotiating or concluding a treaty genuinely believed that the treaty was about something else, something different than, uh, than, it, was, than, it, than it actually was. If there was an error in the mind of the drafter of a treaty or of a person who was authorized to give consent, to express consent to the treaty on behalf of the state. So such an error would invalidate the treaty as applicable to, to that state. 
If a treaty was concluded as a result of fraud or corruption, of course, it should also be invalid. Because both fraud and corruption are factors affecting the free will of a state. Likewise, a treaty, if a treaty is concluded by coercion, this is another ground to, uh, to hold it invalid. Because again, the free will of a state and all international law is about free will of states would be would be affected. And finally, as we as we said earlier, if a treaty conflicts with a rule of use cogens, in turn, if a new rule of use cogens emerges, this new rule would affect a treaty that already applies, and the the treaty. Would, should be invalidated because it, was, it, it would be superseded by the new rule of these courts. Our time is up. We'll, uh, we'll continue tomorrow. As regards the law of treaties, please take the, the coming months and you will have many months before you will plead at the national rounds of the just of competition in this country and some of you will be pleading at the international rounds. Please take some time to read and study the provisions of the Vienna Convention very carefully. Please study those provisions together with that big commentary that you also have at your disposal. It will be very helpful. Let me thank you very much for your work. Thank you.